It was a special kind of paradise, little known by the outside world. Hundreds of tiny islands, blue lagoons, lush forests. The haunting voices of ancient villages. Villages filled with the smiling faces of innocent children. And then the invaders arrive. The summer of 1942 brings World War II to the remote Solomon Islands. The Solomon Islanders were bewildered by this war. It's referred to as the Big Death. That's the way it's translated. By September, the whole world knew the name Guadalcanal. The disaster of Pearl Harbor leads to one setback after another for America and her allies. Weeks after Pearl, Hong Kong falls, January 3rd. Manila is overrun. In February, Singapore is captured. In 1942, the Japanese sweep down the Pacific Rim, taking country after country. It's about the projection of power across vast distances. By April, Japan is building a mega base on Rabaul in New Guinea surging south into the Solomon Islands within striking distance of Australia and New Zealand. The Japanese army captures Guadalcanal in early July, and there to meet them, just a handful of Australians left behind. Not showing you were scared stiff to the Solomon Islands. Martin Clemens is one of three coast watchers on Guadalcanal. He is given a radio and an impossible order. Keep an eye on things. Coast Watches is a name that the Second World War generation were, were familiar with, and they knew what it meant. It meant lonely men on, on tropical islands under great threat of capture and torture and execution. The Royal Australian Navy set up the Coast Watcher organisation and called for volunteers to stay behind, people that knew the territory, the terrain, operating radios behind enemy lines. Clemens works with a band of islanders to spy on the Japanese. He and his scouts make a chilling discovery. The Japanese are building an airstrip on the island. Down from where I was, you see. See the whole thing. He flashes word of the airstrip. This is Clemens, this is Clemens. The airfield on Guadalcanal represents a dramatic increase in Japanese power. From Australia to Washington, the news leaves war planners scrambling. Those airplanes are going to protect Japanese warships and submarines. That force is going to immediately begin to cut America off from her key allies. Guadalcanal, then, this obscure island, becomes the line drawn in the sand. We have to stop them here. With few resources, the Marines get the assignment. Only men available to do the job was the 1st Marine Division in New Zealand. Some 10,000 Marines hit Red Beach. That was the original landing. That was where they landed, 9 in the morning, 7th of August, 1942. When we came in, we had no idea of where we were going uh, and uh, what it was all about. Lou Imfeld was in the first wave. When we landed on Guadalcanal, it was pretty much unopposed. The, the Marines wanted to land at the point, just this side of the point, so that if there's enemy the other side of the point, he can't shoot at you. The enemy over there can't reach you. But the Admiral said he was a bit nervous about there being mines there. They got here that first night, the other side of this river, and then gradually made their way to the airfield and took over the airfield for the afternoon of the next day. The Marines found mostly construction crews and quickly captured the unfinished airstrip, naming it Henderson Field for a flyer lost at Midway. Plunging into malaria-infested jungles, 
The Marines steadily, doggedly enlarged their hold on the island. The Marines were led by General Alexander Vandegrift. The invasion of Guadalcanal is a success, but holding it, that will be a whole different challenge. We were back in the jungles really on a hill in kunai grass and wrapped in, uh, in ponchos and rain when we woke up and, and, and uh, thought we were in a thunderstorm. But it was the, the battle going on and we would see the flashes of the guns. Those guns were the Japanese ravaging Allied ships in the Battle of Savo Island. 1 a.m. August 9th, and the first of four ships sink to the bottom of what would soon be known as Iron Bottom Sound. 1,200 Allied sailors are dead. Sank the Astoria, Vincennes, Quincy, and the Canberra, all heavy cruisers. Hours later, the rest of the U.S. fleet pulls out, taking most of the supplies. So the Navy and all the transports left on the 9th of August. And the 1st Marine Division, watching all this, and they gave themselves the nickname the 1st Marooned Division. And they still bitch at the Navy for abandoning them on Guadalcanal. But the Navy had no option. With less than half of their supplies ashore, the Marine Corps finds itself abandoned in no man's land. So essentially, they're going to have to hold off the Imperial Japanese Army, which no army has yet done in this war with one hand tied behind their back. Short of ammo, food, and even radios, the Marines use what the Japanese left behind. So they were able to communicate using Japanese, the Japanese radio. They finished the airfield using Japanese equipment and fed themselves on Japanese rice. Despite daily air and sea attacks by the Japanese, the Marines finished the airfield by mid-August. First plane to land here was on the 12th of August, it was, a, it was a Catalina. The Catalina was supposed to land in the water, but he radioed in, he had damage to his plane. He had to land on an airstrip. They relented, okay, you can come down. He's landed and they've gone up. Where, where's the damage to the plane? He just said, I, there, I don't have any damage, I just wanted to be the first. Days later, the Marines fly in a handful of Wildcat fighter planes and air operations begin. But the Wildcats were a mismatch against the Japanese Zero. Only early warnings by Coast Watchers would get the Wildcats up fast enough to take on the Zeros. Yet, the Wildcat pilots were legendary, many shooting down dozens of enemy planes. Jeff Dublanc knocked five down in one day. On the ground, the first real test was about to begin as some 900 Japanese soldiers approached the airstrip from the east. Okay, we're at Alligator Creek. It's actually the Ilu River and is the site of the Battle of Tenaru. The Americans had hand-drawn maps when they first came here, and they had the rivers mixed up. They thought this was the Tenaru, whereas the Tenaru was about five kilometers that way. But because they thought it was the Tenaru when the battle occurred, the battle became known as the Battle of Tenaru. This was the eastern boundary of the airstrip. What Marine General Alexander Vandegrift considered a key defensive position. They had all the, the clutter on the beach. They managed to get it all in and set up their eastern perimeter right here. So you've got the runway just over, over yonder, and here was the perimeter. A fluke of war gives the Americans warning of the attack. Coast Watching Scout Jacob Vuza is on a recon trip when he forgets he's carrying an American flag and is caught by the advancing Japanese. What happened was, as the Japanese are questioning him, the first American planes flew in to land at Henderson. They're about a thousand feet up. And the Japanese saw the American stars on them and they started to panic. And not just questioning him now, they're saying, tell us, tell us. They're jabbing him with their bayonets. And by some accounts, he is tied to a tree, bleeding profusely, left to die. The story goes, he frees himself, crawls back to the Americans and warns of the attack. But Guadalcanal historian John Innes a legend in his own right for his painstaking research and battlefield tours, says the badly injured Vuza pulled a fast one on the enemy. He said to the Japanese, I'll take you to the Americans. So he led the Japanese to this point here. As soon as the attack has started, or the shooting started, he's ducked away, and made his way around to the American lines. Near death, he briefed the Americans on the incoming attack. A company of men walk across here and stumble into the barbed wire. The shooting starts. 
Cheeky sends another company across here and across the water to help these guys, and in no time at all, he's blown away 300 men. So the fighting continues all night. At dawn, they released the 1st Battalion from reserve. This made it ways around the back of the battle to stop the Japanese from getting away. In order to stop some Japanese swimming out to sea to get away, the Americans put a squadron of tanks across here facing the Japanese positions. And at the end of the battle, Americans went in to help the wounded Japanese. The wounded Japanese were still trying to kill the Americans. So the order was given to shoot everything. The most extraordinary twist to the battle, the story of three Marines manning a machine gun. One was killed, one was blinded, and the other lost the use of his hands. There was a machine gun position up here about about 100 feet, there were three people in it. Johnny Rivers, Lee Diamond, and Al Schmidt. Johnny Rivers started to fire his guns. The Japanese shot him in the face. The other two took over the gun. A mortar comes in, blows the hands apart of Lee Diamond, and blinds Al Schmidt. But between them, they had a good pair of eyes and a good pair of hands. So they kept firing that gun all night. By the next day, more than 800 Japanese are dead. The world will remember the Teneru by the chilling images of Japanese soldiers frozen in death on the beach. Colonel Ichiki committed ritual suicide. The Marines had their first victory. Because it's the first, it assumes the emblematic quality of this is the proof that we have the courage and the guts to win World War II. So from a little battle, you get this large echo in, in American history. Vuza recovered and became fast friends with the Marines. He was later knighted by Queen Elizabeth, but the battles would continue and intensify. United States warships engaged the Japanese fleet off the Solomon Islands. The Japanese came from the north. Their main objective, to retake Guadalcanal Island and its strategically important airfield. Well, we got bombed every morning and shelled every night. Japanese ships would shell the airfield. By daylight, the Zeros and Betty bombers would return and bomb the airfield. And I'm, while I'm taking you to some battlegrounds, you're living in a battleground now. Every, every hill's got a story. By September, the Japanese army had moved thousands of fresh troops through the jungle valleys, trying to sneak up from the south side of Henderson Field. By night, they charged up a ridge where Colonel Merritt Edson and his raiders were taking an R&R &R break. And he would never have thought when he was digging that, this would be a tourist attraction in 65 years' time. <laughs> Each year, hundreds come here to touch history to experience this sacred ground. So Lucky Raiders, they then go on another expedition to a place called Tassimboko to the east, report of a Japanese landing, they get there and sure enough, they got there just after a large Japanese force had in fact landed and had left that area to move towards the airfield. There was only a small rear guard that was left there that they quickly overcame, but uh, certainly determined there was a large force indeed on their way here. And then the conjecture was, for which direction is the attack going to take place. Because although they had about 12,000 Marines here spread over the perimeter, they didn't have enough for a cordon defence uh, and just guess best where is the attack going to take place from. Edson said, if I was Kawaguchi, the Japanese general, this would be my line of approach. And he pointed at the ridge. This, this would be the Icon Battle. Bloody Ridge extends from where those trees are. That's the beginning of Bloody Ridge. Continues on down the saddle up to here and continues on to that hill over there. Now the length of the ridge to the Japanese looking at it from the air, it looked like a centipede. So they call it Mukadi. This was the final defensive line, but that was uh, the killing ground between there and, and here. You can still see the barbed wire spikes put up by the Marines. Night after night, some 3,000 Japanese kept charging the 830 Americans on the ridge. Said one American, the Japanese attack was almost constant, like a rain that subsides for a moment, then pours harder. Just barely, the Marines held the ridge. The surviving Japanese fled back into the jungle, but there was no time to celebrate. And the fight continued on the ground, on the sea, and in the air. We were just looking for enemy ships, and we found one. We were making a bombing run on that cruiser uh, when they caught us. 
Del Wiley had survived the Battle of the Coral Sea and Midway. The first time we shot at in the Coral Sea, I was scared to death. Then at Midway, the fear was um, lessened considerably. And then when I was shot down and what have you in the boat, no fear whatsoever. Assigned aboard the USS Enterprise, he took off on a mission just before the Enterprise was attacked. His plane was shot down, way behind enemy lines. Well, the first time I'd seen a shark of any size, and I thought, boy, I don't want him hanging around here. So, yes, I shot him. For 15 days, he was alone in a raft. And he prayed to God every single day. I've spoken to a lot of college kids, classes in high school, and every time they ask, did you pray? I says, yes. There ain't no atheists in rubber boats. He drifted and washed up on an island hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. He was saved by the islanders and later moved to a bigger island and rescued by a coast watcher. Eventually, he settled in Fullerton, California, always staying in touch with those who saved his life. I was a PT boat skipper, which of course was a uh, kind of a suicide work. Ted Robinson of Sacramento fought in the Solomons as skipper of a new kind of fast boat. The PT boats were made of plywood. We only operate at night. The ones that cut their supply line at night was us, PT boats. It was not the big fleet. We had to get home before daylight or we would have lost all of us. The Japanese would have a dawn patrol to look for us every, every morning. They became a real nuisance for the Japanese and a target. It was dangerous work. But we had funeral services almost every day. We were losing men. Uh, very heavy casualties. Robinson eventually took part in the rescue of another PT boat captain, John F. Kennedy. Robinson and the other sailors and flyers worked the slot, a shipping channel between the large islands of the Solomons. Their target, the nighttime runs of the Tokyo Express. The Japanese ships were frantically trying to resupply the army on Guadalcanal. You win wars by stopping their ammunition, their medicine, their reinforcements, and that's what we did. Back on Guadalcanal, the fighting continued. Marching single file, long columns of fighting men stream across the island in pursuit of the enemy. Vandegrift got more aggressive with patrols into enemy territory, and a new enemy was taking its toll, the jungle. It looks like just a green carpet. You get under there and that's, you're falling over vines, you're tripping over trees. You grab a hole of the tree to pull you up, it just comes apart in your hand because it's rotted. And I can tell you the landscape is formidable. It's an enemy just by itself. Thousands of Japanese died from starvation and the extremes of the jungle, and thousands of Americans were crippled with malaria. There were more men lost from malaria than there were from the guns of the Japanese. After four months in the jungle, Lou Imfeld and the 1st Division Marines were transferred to Melbourne, Australia to rest and recover. In 2009, Lou received honors upon his return to visit their bivouac site in an historic stadium that later was home to the Olympics. The fighting continued for months on the canal until the last of the Japanese withdrew in the spring of 43. The war moved up the slot, island hopping from that line drawn in the sand all the way to Tokyo. On Guadalcanal, they buried their dead and honored their heroes. Highest honors are awarded officers and men alike. Majors, captains, privates, they've proven themselves in the test by fire. No armchair commander. Admiral Nimitz comes all the way from Hawaii to decorate Major General Vandegrift. These are the men who bore the brunt of the battle. We're at the U.S. Memorial. On the 50th anniversary of the invasion, the Americans dedicated this memorial. High on a hill, within sight of the Japanese memorial. This site was chosen because it gives good views. Nice views of some of the battlefields, galloping horse, seahorse, Savo Island. 
Iron Bottom Sound. Well, the mouth of the Matanikau was very important. They always had a battalion defending it, the Americans, because uh, it was the only place where you can get heavy equipment across the Matanikau. The Japanese were landing all their heavy equipment, bringing it up to the Matanikau, but couldn't get it across. They only managed to get one tank across, and it's still there. You can still see it. But had they not uh, been defending it, the Americans, then the Japanese could have got the equipment dangerously close to the airfield. Now, 75 years later, John still remembers those heroes with their stories. And he remembers in other ways, because even today, this island gives up its dead. Construction on old battlefields brings frequent discoveries. In 2006, John helped identify the remains of a soldier on this hill. When they excavated the site for the memorial, they found the remains of a Marine. There was no identification, so they put a plaque down for the unknown warrior and took his remains back to America. Now, when I was doing some research on this particular maneuver they did, early in the morning of the 19th, they came under fire and a Sergeant John Harold Brannock was killed and they buried him and went on with their mission. Now, the sketch map, I'm looking at it and I said, hey, that's this hill. So this is probably Sergeant John Harold Brannock. Told the authorities in America, and he was buried at Arlington last August. Found the remains of an American, Martin Odenthal, from Portage, Pennsylvania. The address on the dog tag, the next of kin, the family's still living there, so I was able to ring them within 20 minutes of getting back to the office. So I rang his, his brother. The remains were found by a friend of John's in thick, overgrown jungle. John and Justin Talon of Pacific Rex rushed to the scene, finding all sorts of evidence. John then learned the story of Martin and his brother Albert, who both enlisted the same day. Both witnessed the attack at Pearl Harbor, and both ended up in the Solomons. Martin was killed in January of 1943. Albert died eight months later on New Georgia Island. When John Innes asked what he should do with Martin's remains, the family quickly, emotionally said, we want him home. A touching find was that he had one of these bottles with a top on it, like, like that, and six matches inside to keep him dry. Well, I got that back to the family. On Hill 27, he helped identify the remains of a Japanese soldier. We found remains in there. We thought he was an American at first. Turned out he wasn't. He was Toshio Kojima. He was a second lieutenant in the 228th Infantry. Went in digging, found his dog tag, was Japanese. So his sister got a dog tag back in, in Nagoya. So she was 82 at the time. And uh, interestingly, the, I put some flowers in a bottle for him. And there are those pink flowers. Uh, they still come through. And on Mount Austin, below the spider tree, he found the spot his dear friend Bill Fisher had laid his head after being injured. Six of his friends were killed there while on a march with the raiders. They brought up three companies of men, occupied these positions. The Japanese then come a short time later. They've run down into those trees, the Americans firing at them and throwing grenades at them. There was a two-hour two -hour firefight where was the action on the 3rd of December? It became an obsession for John, proving this was the scene of the battle, where Bill spent the night with the rest of the survivors. So I then went looking for some evidence that for one day in the life of this hill, Americans were here for one day. If he could find the rusted evidence of the firefight, it would solve the mystery. What I did, I, I had the grass longer than it is now. So I've gone in trying to find something which was utterly impossible. But fortunately, there was an act of God. Somebody found a Zippo lighter and set fire to the grass. And it was, uh, I didn't do it. So we came back on the Sunday and it was clear as a bell in there. And within minutes, I picked up 17 firing pins from hand grenades, lots of fragmentation pieces. I filled up two plastic bags full of stuff. Rang Bill. Now describe Bill. Bill, dear, dear, terrific guy, but cranky old bastard. Had 10 kids, maybe that's what made him that way. He's in bed. Where, where do I'm John? I'm in bed. It's Bill, Bill, I found your spot. Yeah, all right, I'll be there next month. And he just looked around, impassive with his bulldog look. Grim, you know. Then he said, uh, I slept over there. Back of my hair, <laughs> neck. Yes. 
And uh, I said to him, uh, according to Carlson, you sang patriotic songs that night. God bless America, and the other one was Onward Christian Soldiers. When Bill died at his Tennessee home in 2006, he had just one last request, that his ashes be returned to Guadalcanal. Bill passed away uh, last year. Uh, but he had spoken to me beforehand. He said, John, uh, when my time comes, we'll scatter my ashes under the tree. So on the 3rd of December, which was the anniversary time, came up here and had the choir from Barana Village. They sang Onward Christian Soldiers. And Bill's with his other six mates that uh, didn't make it. They're, they're here too, somewhere. So uh, yeah, so this is a pretty important spot. After 75 years, on the island of the Big Death, no one has forgotten the price of freedom.